Okay, good afternoon and welcome to the Simons Electron Microscopy Center's Winter EM course. Today we're well into our last modality of EM and that's on if you can take your macromolecule of interest and form a nice ordered array. And you can see that, you know, the whole field has been getting a second wind in terms of single particle that's been driving a lot of the you know, advancements and giving more awareness to the other techniques like the tomography techniques and the ordered array techniques that we've been talking about yesterday or rather last week we talked about micro ED and today we're going to be talking about let's say you can form that order array and wrap it up into a tube or a filament and I think what's the most important is to understand that we practice multimodal uh, structural biology and that's not just talking about combining NMR, X-ray, and EM but then within EM and a lot of our lecturers especially our lecturer today Greg Lucian has combined many modes within EM meaning combining single particle tomography as well as helical reconstructions. And you might say, how useful are helical reconstructions? Quite useful, especially if you want to look at cytoskeletal dynamics, if you want to use certain model systems, and anytime you can form an ordered array. And our lecture today, Greg Lucian's coming from Rockefeller. He has made use of all these techniques. And I do encourage you, the people in the room, ask questions because you have people in the EM community in New York, and, and they have been using this technique day in, day out, and you have an opportunity to interact with them. Great. Great. Thanks so much, Ed. It's a pleasure to be here. Thanks, everyone, for coming. And as Ed said, please um, interrupt me as I'm talking. I think uh, helical processing is a, sometimes a bit counterintuitive. So if you have questions, you're like, this doesn't make any sense at all, please just stop me and, and let me know. I've tried to keep this lecture fairly light and not, not deeply mathematical, because Fernando Sosa is actually coming to give a follow-up talk next week that will delve more into the dark art of indexing helical diffraction patterns. Um, so I wanted to today mostly give a, a sort of overview. Uh, well, so first, um, before we get into that, uh, why would you even do helical uh, cryodynamic helical filaments? As uh, Ed mentioned, um, they're really common in biology. So uh, I just sort of highlighted a couple examples here of. Uh, cytoskeletal filaments that are found uh, in, in the cell, in all cells actually, bacterial cells, eukaryotic cells. And I've actually focused on these two particular um, categories of cytoskeletal filaments in my career. Um, so these actually have a really uh, long historical importance in EM. Uh, part of the reason that these were chosen as initial systems for focus in cryo-EM is they literally cannot be crystallized. So actually, if you wanted to do any sort of structural biology on a cytoskeletal filament, you couldn't do uh, x-ray crystallography. Um, you could do fiber diffraction, but you couldn't form 3D crystals because the symmetry of these filaments is actually incompatible with the point group symmetries required to form a three-dimensional crystal. So they actually kind of drove a lot of the early technology in image processing and EM um, because people had no other choice, but they were really important biologically, and so they were uh, selected for study. Um, the final reason I'd say that it's useful to study helical filaments is that actually um, the helical symmetry of these filaments is really powerful for extracting um, three-dimensional information from uh, two-dimensional projection images of, of objects. Uh, and actually, uh, this was really important in the historical development of EM, and so I'll come to that in a minute. Everyone is frantically working. Is that everything OK? Everything's okay. fine. <laughs> You're doing great. All right, so uh, today I wanted to touch on two things, two, two broad sections of the, the lecture. Um, so first I wanted to give sort of a brief overview of helices and helical image processing, um, some of the sort of higher level concepts. Again, I'm not gonna get into uh, what's called indexing, which we'll come to in a little bit because Fernando is gonna talk about that uh, next week and I think he's, he has much more expertise in that topic than I do. Um, and then the second uh, half of the talk, I wanted to get into just a sort of survey of uh, problematic cases, I'll call them, or challenging cases in uh, the history of helical processing and how people have dealt with them. And I'm not gonna go into too, too much depth in any of them, but I sort of put references in the slides that you can refer to if you ever encounter a similar case in your own studies. Um, and so that will be a good starting point for figuring out how to deal with those challenges. I'm titling that section Mostly Microtubules, sort of an analogy to Mostly Mozart, if anyone's a classicist, uh, because uh, most of the uh, actually challenging cases that uh, I, I thought of were, were in the case of microtubules, which I actually have worked on a lot of my career, so that's not a coincidence. Okay. Um, 
So first, uh, we'll start with the, the brief overview of helices. And I just put a couple references here if you want to get into more depth. I think this chapter in um, Bob Glazer's book by David DeRossier is really a fantastic resource if you want to get into the math of uh, helical diffraction. And um, this review chapter by uh, Karsten Sosch is a really useful resource for, for a lot of the things that I um, put in here today, if you want to go into sort of the more modern methods of helical process. Okay. So what is a helix? Let's start with that. Um, <clears throat> so I think you encounter helices in your everyday life quite a bit. An example that I like is a spiral staircase, right? So you can see here you have steps going up around a central axis, and as you uh, go up a step, you also have to rotate to continue around that axis. And really that is the fundamental definition of a helix. Um, so I call it a vectorial assembly, where the uh, subunit arrangement is described by basically two parameters. One is a rise, so how you go from this step to this step, how much distance do you actually have to travel along the axis, and then a rotation, how far around the axis do you have to go. Um, been described as a 1.5 dimensional crystal. Basically, it's a straight line of things, but you actually have to go around the second rotational dimension to create the assembly. And one of the reasons why it's thought that this is so common in, in biology is actually this is the simplest um, regular uh, molecular assembly you can make. So it's basically defined by a single interface. So if two things can stick together, they can basically likely make a helix. And so a lot of things have evolved to form helices in biology. And I mentioned this, but yeah, the, the, the real two parameters that we want and are really, really important for extracting um, three-dimensional information from EM images of helices are these uh, rise and the twist, um, the rotational component. All right, <clears throat> so as it turns out, the first uh, three-dimensional EM structure ever solved was of a helical assembly. Um, so everyone who is a student of EM should go read this paper. It's a really amazing paper. I read it again when I was preparing this lecture and it basically predicts everything that will happen in uh, 3D EM, so it's really a, a good thing to read. Um, but uh, I want to read a quote from that paper that explains why they chose this specimen um, to work on, which is um, the sort of tail spike of a bacteriophage. So this is actually uh, um, a negative stain EM image. You can sort of see the subunits here. You see those little dots, and you can kind of tell that they're, they're um, rotationally arranged. And this is actually the sort of balsa wood cutout model that they calculated by hand from the, um, uh, the diffraction pattern of that image. All right, so why, why are helices useful to study, and why was this chosen? So as we all know, you actually have to use um, different views of your of your object to create a three-dimensional reconstruction of your object, right? So in a single particle, you squirt your molecule onto the grid and you hope that it lands in all these different orientations so that you can calculate a three-dimensional reconstruction. But in the case of a helical object, right, we actually get all the different views of our molecule in the helix, right? So the asymmetric of this unit of this helix is actually arranged rotationally. So as we go up along the helix, we actually get all the side views that we need to um, reconstruct the density distribution of the asymmetric unit. So that's uh, that's sort of cap encapsulated in this quote. Um, so the basic idea is that you can actually get a complete tomographic series of your uh, of your object from a single image of a helix. Um, and so that was why, basically, uh, de Rossier and Clue decided to start with uh, a helical object for the first two-dimensional reconstruction. OK. So how do we actually extract that information from that image? And this is where we're going to get a little bit into the uh, diffraction pattern. So you actually have to use um, Fourier space analysis, at least historically, to get um, a three-dimensional structure of um, the asymmetric unit of this helix from a, from a 2D projection image. Um, so uh, Hernando's going to go into this in much more detail during his lecture. So I just wanted to give a sort of conceptual overview of where the information comes from in this uh, diffraction pattern. Um, so uh, the first thing uh, is just some terminology. So, um, so 
this part of the diffraction pattern, the part that's sort of arranged along this axis here, is called the equator. And that actually gives you um, information about the overall sort of shape of this tube or the density distribution along its width, like this. Okay. So if you imagine if this didn't have subunits, if it was just sort of like a, a tube that wasn't um, repetitive in this dimension, you would be able to get all the information about it just from this section of the Fourier transform. Um, the other term that's important is called the meridian. So the diffraction pattern is actually also divided into two halves this way. And if you look at this with your eyes, you can probably see that this is fairly symmetric, actually, right? You see that all these little dots here that I'll explain in a second um, look the same on both sides of this pattern. The reason for that is that you can think of this pattern as being the sum of two views of the helix. One is if you're looking into the board, the helix from the front, right? You can see the, the front side of the helical path. The other would be looking from behind the helix in the back, right? And so there's actually two sets of um, subunit patterns that are arranged on top of each other. And those are basically contributing to the two uh, halves of the diffraction pattern. If you don't understand that, it's, it's not a huge deal for now. The one thing I'll just say is that whenever you start working on a helix, you always want to look at one of these diffraction patterns. And if it's not symmetric, that means there's something wrong with your sample. It means that either the back half of it is flattened or it's really badly tilted out of the axis of the image and so that it will be challenging to process. So you want to look for a helical specimen where the um, diffraction pattern is symmetric on the two sides to start with. Like how symmetric? So on this this example, it's not. Yeah, a this is. Uh, I, I chose this example historically, right? Because mm -hmm. this is the first one. So this one actually isn't that symmetric. Mm -hmm. It's not perfectly symmetric, and that is because this is a negative stain specimen. So actually, the back half it's will not be down. properly stained, and it will be somewhat flat. Mm -hmm. um, cool. In cryo, I'll show you an example of a really nice diffraction pattern, and it should be uh, really symmetric. Um, finally, uh, and you know, most characteristically, you have what are called layer lines, which are these um, uh, lines that are above the equator in both directions. And that is actually telling you about the uh, axial density distribution, or the subunit spacing along the length of the helix. So some of you may have seen the sort of famous diffraction pattern of DNA, um, and you saw that sort of cross pattern. So that is the characteristic pattern of uh, helical layer lines. All right, so um, I find it difficult to explain why you get lines without using a whiteboard. So I'm going to give you a brief uh, sort of conceptual description of why lines. Um, all right, so can you see the board? Yeah, looks good. All right, so I told you before that um, the diffraction pattern that we get from a helical tube is really uh, basically the sum of the, of the images of the front and the back of the tube, right? So let's imagine a, a conceptual sort of toy case. So you, you had the 2D crystallography section last week, right? So maybe you saw some, something like this. So let's imagine that we have a lattice, of, a 2D lattice of dots. Anyone tell me what the diffraction pattern of that 2D lattice of dots would look like? No? Any guesses? In Fourier space, if you have a repetitive array, what do you get? What type of signal do you get? Lines? No, but okay. good guess. Um, you do get lines from helices, but if you always have the same distance here, right? distance is little p, then you basically get a signal that corresponds to that distance. And so you basically get a spot. You get something like this. So this would be the center. Okay. And this would be proportional to 1 over u. Now let's imagine that we roll this set of spots into a tube. Okay. So if we do that, if this is the front of the tube, then imagine that we wrap it around the back. And so when we do that, effectively, this set of spots will now be tilted in the other direction. 
hopefully it's clear that the there's an angle up like that here mm. and down like that here, right? So if we then superimpose these two sets of dots, we now get a Fourier transform that looks like that. So That's hopefully this is starting to look somewhat reminiscent of what you saw on the previous slide. So then this would be where the equator is, and this would be the meridian. Okay? Now why lines and not dots? The reason for that is that it's because we're not just superimposing these two sets of uh, spots on top of each other, but in fact we're wrapping them into a tube. So <coughs> if we did that, what you can imagine happening, I'm just going to erase the back of the tube for now and focus on the front, is that if we uh, start wrapping this up, right, then this little D spacing isn't going to remain constant anymore in projection. So as we start wrapping the tube, right, the center of the tube will look a lot like this, because it's not very curved from your perspective looking down on the tube. But this will start to look like it's closer to this dot, right? So you probably have something like this. So again, this will still be D. But then the next one over will be a little bit closer. And it's a nice symmetric tube, it will be symmetric. And then as we get towards the edge of the tube, right, where it's really curving a lot, this will be even closer. Does that make sense? So you can sort of picture this in your mind as you wrap up the tube. So now we have a number that's smaller than D, and a number that's even smaller than D. Much, much less than D, let's say. And so, um, so now we have different spacings effective spacings in the 2D projection of our lattice, right? Um, and so if something is the inverse, um, then if it looks closer together in real space, it will actually extend farther in the Fourier space, right? So that's why you get the lines, because you actually are sort of stretching out the spacing in Fourier space from these spots that become closer to closer together in real space. Um, and because, again, because we have the front and back of the tube, that's how you get it. Um, these extended lines in the Fourier space. So you really want these nice long lines because that's telling you that your tube is nice and round um, and that you're getting nice high resolution images of your tube. If you squish the tube, if you make the tube flat, right, then you just have the two lattices on top of each other and you will just get spots. So that tells you your tube is bad, actually, and you don't want to process it. It's not round. And that's a com common symptom in, in, for instance, negative staining of helical tubes. Um, the reason you get multiple sets of lines, just briefly, before we go on, this and this, is because um, we're not actually looking at, at point sources in our EM images, right? We're looking at macromolecules. So those macromolecules actually have internal features. And you can see those features at higher and higher resolution if you slice them up into finer and finer pieces. So this is a lot like 3D crystallography, where you get you know, these uh, different Miller indices with finer and finer slicing um, in Fourier space. So these will actually be spaced with um, sort of integer slicing, uh, spacing of the actual repeat distance of your subunits in your labs. The main thing I want you to take away from that is that you want lots of lines. The more lines you have, the higher resolution your image is, the better it is for um, 3D processing. Okay, so that's all I wanted to say about diffraction patterns. Does anyone have any questions about that? I know it's not super intuitive. Um, Hernando's going to go into it in excruciating detail. Next <laughs> so get ready. <laughs> All right. Great. Okay. So, um, just to remind you from what I said before, um, remember the Fourier transform is one over distance, so you want lots and lots of lines. That means you're getting really nice high resolution. And even though we don't usually use um, the sort of traditional analysis anymore to extract uh, 3D structures from these images, it's actually still really important to analyze this diffraction pattern because it's going to be the thing that tells you your rise and your twist. <laughs> 
and you really need really good um, guesses for the rise and the twist to start any other way of processing your helices. So it's still really important to um, do this analysis for a new sample if you don't know anything about your sample already. And so there, I just highlighted a couple tools here that are, are helpful for doing that. Um, but uh, yeah, it's also a good idea to ask, ask experts for help uh, to do that um, if you have an entirely new helix. So um, I'm gonna move on from there. Um, just to mention historically, uh, again, historically, one of the first really high resolution structures was also calculated um, using helical analysis. This is the uh, acetylcholine receptor from Nigel Unwin. Around the same year, there's also a similar resolution structure of flagellin that was solved by Keichi Namba. Uh, I just chose to highlight the Unwin uh, structure because they actually included their uh, diffraction patterns in some of their structures. So if we if we compare with this way transform here, right, where this is like maybe 40 angstroms resolution, this is four angstroms resolution. You can see how many lines actually went into the uh, solution of that structure, where you could really start to see some um, side chain level detail. So this was way before direct detectors, way before um, any of the modern uh, tools. So you could get some actually very high resolution cryonium structures from, from helical samples um, in the early 2000s. Okay, but how do we actually do it now practically? Um, so nowadays, almost everyone um, would use what we call a sort of hybrid method with single particle to analyze helical samples. The reason for that is that to get these nice, super high resolution uh, diffraction patterns, you basically need a perfectly crystalline helix of your sample, and that almost never exists in nature except for highly optimized cases. So there's a reason why there's only these two, resol two high resolution structures of something, that's because most things don't diffract like that. So um, usually nowadays what we're going to do is sort of take advantage of all the power of single particle to deal with heterogeneity at the molecular level, but also take advantage of the helical symmetry at the same time. So generally what we do is actually pick little overlapping um, segments of our helical filaments and then use a method called the Iterative he Real Space Helical Refinement um, Procedure, which was developed by Ed Eagleman to analyze our sample. Okay, and I just want to show you here that these green, green circles are examples of uh, the centers of all the boxes that we picked, and these red boxes are the actual sides of the box segment, so you can see that they're actually overlapping. And if anyone's interested, this is uh, an actin complex from, from my lab. Okay, so how does IHRSR work? Um, basically what you do is you need some sort of reference, just like you do for any single particle um, analysis procedure, and then you basically do projection matching. So you make projections of your reference, um, and then you match your particles to those projections, just as you do in single particle. The only thing that's really different is that we then try to find the helical symmetry that we know exists in our sample from the reconstruction that we derive from those um, from those reference projections. So basically, you do some projection matching, you align your particles to the projections of this reference, you calculate an asymmetric reconstruction, but if you look at this asymmetric reconstruction, you can see that there are actually helically repetitive features in that um, reconstruction. You see these asymmetric, uh, these, uh, these subunits appearing through the noise in that reconstruction. So then we can actually do an autocorrelation search of this reconstruction with itself to try to find where those repetitive features exist. So if I take this and I translate it and spin it, right, eventually I'll hit an orientation of this uh, volume where it matches itself really well. And so I say, okay, um, because I've done a two parameter search, that rise and that twist, I assign those as the rise and twist of my reconstruction and then I symmetrize it um, and get back a helically symmetric reference. And then I repeat this procedure over and over again. And by doing that, you can both refine the orientations of your particles and actually refine the helical parameters of your helix, right? Because you're basically improving the resolution of this reconstruction as you go and improving your uh, fit of the helical parameters. So this is great, it's very simple. It works in many, many cases. The only thing to keep in mind when you do this is that it is quite sensitive to your initial guess of the rise and twist, right? So you're doing a local parameter search. So you have to tell this algorithm where to start. 
and you can actually get trapped in a local minimum and get totally incorrect reconstructions that nevertheless um, fix the helical parameters eventually. So it's still critically important to have uh, an approximately right initial guess of the rise and twist. And that's one of the reasons why um, Fourier vessel analysis is still really important uh, in the field. Um, but once you have those good guesses, or if you're working on something like actin or a microtubule or, or some uh, virus tail where the helical parameters are already kind of known, then it's perfectly okay to start from the stage and you will likely get a high resolution reconstruction if it's a well behaved sound. Okay. And I'll just mention that in addition to Fourier vessel analysis, another good method for getting helical parameters that isn't used that much but should probably be used more and I think will be used increasingly is to actually do uh, cryo-electron tomography on your specimen. Um, so if you have a specimen where you can collect some nice tomography data with sufficient resolution that you can actually see the subunits in your structure, then you can basically just directly tell what the rise and the twist are and use that to prime the uh, IHRSR algorithm. There's a couple examples where this has been used to good effects and uh, produce, some, produce some nice results. I have a question. Yeah. So great. if you go back a couple slides. Yep. One more. More. Would you be able to guess just by a scale bar mm -hmm. what the separation from rise is from uh, the protomer here? And if you were to just guess, <coughs> what would happen? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, you might be able to guess in this case uh, because it's a pretty simple helical structure. Uh, so. Um, but that's only probably true because in the case of actin, which this is, right, you only have two strands and they wind around each other in a kind of obvious way. So you might be able to make a relatively educated guess as to what it is, but it's actually, historically, actin was a hard thing to solve. And that's one of the reasons why Ed developed the IHRSR algorithm, right? Because, for instance, actin doesn't have uh, an integer number of subunits per 360 degrees of helix, which is kind of um, historically been useful in indexing helical diffraction patterns. So How many biological samples do you have an integer number of whatever per 360? Is it common? It's pretty uncommon. Uh, it's pretty uncommon, I okay. would say. Um, but it was historically useful for indexing. Okay. Even if you're like slightly off, it'll still work sure. out. But this one is pretty off. So, okay. um, yeah. So, uh, yeah, in the case of actin, right, you could even see by eye here this, okay, it looks like there's kind of three subunits within this length, but, um, and then you might actually, in the case of actin, get the rise and twist approximately right. Um, but that's, I would say, a lot of samples don't look as clean in projection as actin. So then in this right image, all of your boxes and your little the green circles that indicate each, you know, pr protomer, mm -hmm. pro that's from information that you have Ah, yeah. Previously. How do you choose where to put the boxes? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So um, there's some debate about that in the field, actually. Uh, some early papers suggested using 90% overlap. Um, uh, I would say it probably depends on the spacing of your of your subunit. So you may want to go back and rebox your sample once you know uh, what the rise is. And it, it kind of intuitively makes sense to use a sort of integer multiple of the subunit spacing to to always have new material in the center of your box. Um, the reason for that is that you won't then have very large shifts for certain particles that um, are not centered on a new asymmetric unit. Thanks. It's a good question. Um, yeah, so in this case we used, uh, I think, three, we go up three as asymmetric units per box. Um, I'll just mention um, before going on to the tr problematic cases that uh, even though there is this nice IHRSR procedure, um, and I sort of implied that you've, you've symmetrized your volume at the end of this procedure sort of in real space, in practice actually getting high resolution helical reconstructions with this method, we, we still actually do the reconstruction procedure in uh, Fourier space. And we take advantage of the fact that we can basically make symmetry mates of our each particle and actually insert them in Fourier space um, 
uh, without any of the interpolation errors that you get in real space to get a nice high resolution reconstruction. So what we actually do in practice is for each segment that we're going to insert in our reconstruction, we project and match it on our, uh, our reference. And then we take our particle and we say, OK, I've inserted you here in your middle. But I know that there's another subunit in you uh, at this axial spacing, and that should match with this rotation. So we actually insert copies of each particle into the reconstruction, just um, phase shifting the uh, origin of the particle by integer multiples of the rise, and then adjust the um, phi angle by the twist. So we go up twice in this case. Here we're going to go down twice. And by doing this procedure, we effectively multiply the power of each of these segments by the number of asymmetric subunits that are in them. And that's, uh, this was a sort of innovation by Carson Sosh and Gregorius lab that allowed him to get, in this case, a uh, four and a half angstrom resolution structure of TMB uh, back in 2007. And basically this is, um, some version of this procedure is used in all of the uh, modern uh, uh, packages. So I just wanted to let you know that's that's what's sort of going on under the hood when you do a, a helical reconstruction with, for instance, rely on. Finally, yes. Is there an artifact of using the same information? Like it seems a little bit redundant to use the same picture multiple times in the reconstruction. Is mm -hmm. there any artifacts of these? Uh, yeah. So um, you may notice here that there's this sort of uh, dying off of the signal in the axial direction. Um, one of the reasons for that, there are two reasons for that. One is that if you shift this up and down, right, then this part of it is no longer contributing to the center of the reconstruction. So you actually do get these sort of tapering artifacts, and only the central part is actually good. Mm -hmm. So usually what, for instance, Realign or Relyon will do is they'll just cut out the central 30% of the reconstruction and sort of fill the box with that. Um, uh, the other way that you can get artifacts is if you, you basically need to tell the program how many times to do this. And you only want to do it the number of times that there is actually a new subunit um, present in that box that wasn't already averaged in the reconstruction. So in the case of, say, uh, I forget what it is for TMB, but let's say that I boxed my helix such that there are 13 new subunits in each of these little sections, right? If I then tell the program to that there are 39 new subunits, it will dramatically overestimate the signal and noise ratio of the reconstruction, right? Because it thinks it's done way more averaging than it actually has. So you actually have to tell the program how many new subunits are in each um, box to get a properly weighted um, reconstruction. So that's another source of, um, of art. But yeah, this only this only works right if it is actually a symmetric helix. Otherwise, you'll get all sorts of artifacts. But um, but uh, yeah, otherwise, um, if, if you do have the helical symmetry, you, you definitely want to use it because it will um, really dramatically improve. Uh, you basically amplify your data by the number of of asymmetric units you have in each part. So it's kind of similar to. Icosahedral viruses, for instance. Okay, so um, if you're still with me, um, you're probably asking if I get a helical sample, what should I actually do? Um, so if you know the helical parameters uh, already, I recommend just using rely on, um, which probably most of you have encountered in your uh, careers. Uh, so those introduced in rely on two and uh, Helical processing is present in rely on three. Um, so it has a lot of advantages. You know, it has the nice graphical user interface. It actually has an auto picking uh, algorithm that works quite well if you have some nice 2D class averages of your segments. Um, its 2D and 3D classification procedures have been optimized to work with helical specimens, um, and, but it still does all the nice rely on stuff like polishing, et cetera. So, um, really, uh, although I gave you a sort of historical overview, um, you should probably, unless you have a reason not to, um, use rely on. That's what my lab does. Um, um, all right, so any questions thus far? No. Great.
All right, so that was my plan sort of intro to the, uh, to the problem. And so now in the second half, I was going to go through um, sort of problems that have arisen and how people have dealt with them um, sort of over the, over the course of the field. And uh, because I mostly worked on microtubules, but also because they have a lot of problems associated with them, I'm primarily going to focus on microtubules, although we are going to briefly talk about um, amyloids, because those have also been a nice uh, uh, subject of uh, helical processing. OK. So what are the problems that can arise, and how can you deal with them? So uh, in the case of amyloids, a problem that aris arose was that asymmetric unit in the, um, in the filament is actually invisible, right? It's just a beta strand. So how do you deal with that? Um, in the case of microtubules, a lot of problem problems arose. Um, so one is that they're built from subunits that are actually indistinguishable at low resolution. So they're very similar, but not distinct. Um, you can also get samples that contain a mixture of different symmetries. So you can imagine that you probably have to do some classification. Uh, what if your helix isn't actually a helix? So you can actually get theoretically sort of tube-like structures that have discontinuities or, or issues with them um, that can be dealt with. Uh, and then the last two are just sort of for fun, but what if you have two helices wrapped around each other? What do you do? Or um, an actually common case that will probably be more and more common in the future is what if you have, for instance, a filament and some protein binds that filament, but that protein is uh, asymmetric. What do you do then? All right, so we're going to go through all these, and then you can Stop me if I'm going way over. Uh, OK, so what if my asymmetric unit is invisible? Um, so this was identified as a problem relatively early on with amyloids. So I'm sure you're all familiar with amyloids. They cause a lot of neurodegenerative diseases. And they're made from these little tiny peptides. And those peptides build up this big beta strand structure that you can see has uh, a helical pitch, right? So you can see here, this is. Um, sort of ribbon-like structure of the amyloid when you view it um, side on. And then as it rotates around, you get these crossover positions in the amyloid. Um, so if you take a Fourier transform of, of this image, um, which was again collected on film, you could see the equator. And you get a big, big, big area of nothing. And then you get a nice diffraction spot at 4.8 angstroms, the spacing of the beta strand. So this was actually a huge problem because you basically had nothing within this that you could use to align those images on top of each other. Um, you could get these nice cross-sectional views where you, if you look from the bottom of this ribbon, right, you could actually see the separation of the strands um, from that orientation, but you couldn't actually see their stacking on top of each other. So actually, a lot of people worked on this problem for quite some time. And I just wanted to highlight one, I think, important historical uh, well, it's not that old, but one, one effort that was really important that hasn't really uh, seen that much fruit yet, but I think um, is really worth looking at if you're interested in helical methods. Um, so uh, Alexis Ruhu developed this program, Freelix, uh, where he actually built this sort of filament model processing package where you could actually sort of pick the crossovers of all of these filaments and actually track their sort of um, track where the internal subunits must be given the sort of architectural progression of the filament through the micrograph. Um, so it's a very sophisticated algorithm. It basically tracks these waypoints and then calculates in between where all of the beta strands should be. Uh, and this could really be really useful for helices that have some sort of disorder or if you want to track um, basically uh, invisible internal features. However, at the time, uh, it didn't really produce much improvement over the results in this paper. You basically got the same answer. And so I feel like uh, you know, people just didn't use this. But I still think that a lot of the ideas in this paper are really uh, interesting and useful and um, should be revisited. What did work was rely on. So basically, uh, um, this is a really beautiful paper from Anthony Fitzpatrick, who's now at Columbia, uh, where they were actually able to find uh, the separation of these beta strands in an actual uh, tau filament from the brain 
of a patient who died of Alzheimer's disease. So this is actually one of the first examples that I know of, maybe the first example of actually a disease causing molecule from an actual person having a structure solved with cryo-EM. Um, and they could basically see the spacing of those uh, beta strands. Yeah. Now, to get this result, they did have to have some tweaking of the uh, parameters in rely on, particularly this regularization parameter, which you probably, if you ever use rely on, probably ignored. Um, this is a dangerous parameter where you can actually start boosting noise in your images and getting artifactual results. So you have to be really careful if you're doing this. Um, but it did, it worked. So it was a pretty stunning result. Um, so basically, uh, there's there've been a lot of papers recently on, on amyloids, and uh, I think there's even a new one from um, Shores Lab. Uh, so it's actually been a really a breakthrough, I think, in the analysis of these samples. Real quick, what's the difference between the structure on the top and the bottom? I don't remember. Got it. Okay. I think there are two different species of the amyloid peptide that like coexist, but I don't I don't remember the details. Okay. Um, okay. So that's all I wanted to say about amyloids. Anyone have a question about that? Yeah. All right. Um, so onto microtubules. So uh, microtubules are a set of skeletal filament. Um, they're like these tube-like big polymers. You think they'd be really easy to solve their structure with cryo-EM. They have a lot of mass. They're really obvious in the electron microscope. They're really pretty. But actually, um, they caused a lot of problems uh, for processing over the years. I just wanted to highlight three here. So the first problem, um, microtubules are built from tubulin, which is a heterodimer of two 40 kilodalton subunits. Uh, and that heterodimer, the two subunits in the heterodimer, are really, really, really similar to each other. So similar to each other that you can't distinguish them until you get past like eight angstroms or even five angstroms resolution. Um, so this really confounded the alignment of the images of the microtubule because you couldn't tell the two subunits apart and you mix them. So if you just look at a Fourier transform of that, of an image of a microtubule, you got a really nice signal at 40 angstroms, which is the spacing of the monomer, not the dimer. And so this caused a lot of problems for many years. Um, the second problem with the microtubule is that it's not actually a true helix for most microtubule species. So you can see in this cartoon, if we follow around the track of this alpha tubulin subunit, there is a point where it eventually contacts a beta tubulin, a beta tubulin subunit as you go around uh, the helix of the microtubule. Um, so this is a so-called microtubule seam that is present in um, the native uh, lattice of microtubule, which contains 13 of these so-called protocols. So if you were somehow able to tell these two things apart, you'd also have to find where this discontinuity exists in every single image of microtubules you want to combine together to form a, a nice high resolution 3D reconstruction. And then the final problem with microtubules is that when you polymerize them in vitro, you don't ju just get this 13 protofilament um, uh, type. You actually get mixtures with um, different numbers of uh, protofilaments. Um, so this is just a NEM cross-section of a, a preparation of microtubules where you can see you get 13, 14, 15, 11, 16. You get a lot of different um, arrangements. And so you have to somehow sort all of this out if you ever want to get um, a high resolution structure of a microtubule. Uh, so how did people do this? Um, so the first approach <laughs> that, that worked um, back in the 90s uh, was to basically find examples of microtubules in your preparations that uh, don't have 13 protofilaments, but have a different number of protofilaments that actually avoids this discontinuity you're seeing. Um, so uh, Hernando is actually involved in this uh, work uh, during his, I guess, post-op? So I shouldn't say. Back when he was working with Ron Miller. Uh, so, um, so for instance, 11 protofilament microtubules or certain species of 15 protofilament microtubules are perfect helices. So you could actually use these to do traditional Fourier vessel analysis um, and get out what at the time were really great reconstructions um, in the sort of 30 to 40 angstrom range. Uh, 
But, uh, you know, as I noted before, Fourier Bessel analysis really requires your sample to be perfect, and these are not perfect, and so you never got to super high resolution of these methods. And moreover, this is not the native state of the filament, so you want to actually get the native complex uh, eventually. Um, the next thing that was uh, used um, by Ken Downing's lab was just to average alpha and beta tubulin together. So once it was figured out that they're so similar to each other, um, which was done by uh, electron crystallography, uh, people decided, okay, let's just average them together and get some sense of, of what the microtubule looks like. And this actually worked pretty well. Um, this structure went to about eight angstroms resolution back in 2002. Um, and you could see the secondary structure of the uh, tubulin dimer, um, which you could then fit the crystallographic structure into this map. So this was great, but you couldn't really see um, anything special going on at the scene. Um, so uh, what was then recognized is that perhaps we could distinguish alpha and beta tubulin apart by placing some sort of fiducial marker on the microtubule that actually recognizes the dimer. And it just so happens that nature has made such a fiducial for us. Um, so there are actually a lot of microtubule binding proteins that do recognize the dimer. And one that has been prominent in the history of microtubule analysis is kinesin. So the kinesin motor domain binds uh, at the center of the alpha beta tubulin dimer. It gives you a nice fat uh, mass that you can use to actually distinguish um, alpha and beta tubulin. Um, so this was used by Chuck Sindelar when he was in Ken Downing's lab <coughs> to solve the first uh, sort of pretty decent resolution structure of a kinesin complex of an actual uh, bona fide 13 protofilament microtubule. And here you can see that seam running right up the middle here between the two uh, sets of kinesins that are not following a helical path. Um, the other thing that Chuck did in this paper that was really important was he realized that if he had this Fiducial, although he couldn't get a super high resolution structure of the entire microtubule, he could actually rotationally average this um, structure around itself. So imagine if you take this uh, map and then rotate it by one protofilament and shift it up by one um, heterodimer, I could then average this guy on top of this guy. Um, however, this guy going on to the top of this guy is bad, right? These are not the same, so you get a distortion here. But you can rotate this 13 times and get out one protofilament that actually has a correct average structure um, of that protofilament. And so by doing that, he was able to get a uh, sub-nanometer resolution structure of the kinesin microtubule interface. The microtubule itself was distorted, but he got one good protofilament, so we could actually see the interface that he um, and so, uh, so that example was really important so that you could find the seam using that mm -hmm. kinesin of the fiducial. Mm -hmm. Similarly, you said before that like you've got this alpha and beta tubulin. Is there any natural occurring like binding protein that just binds alpha or beta tubulin that you could use as a marker so you could uh, identify ooh. which is which? That's a good question. Um, uh, so you could you could. You, like you can actually tell them apart in this map. Okay. Um, so you actually don't need one that specifically recognizes alpha and beta. So they, they do have differences. Mm -hmm. There's actually a prominent loop on the inner surface of the microtubule that I'm not showing that is way longer in alpha than beta. So even at this resolution, at eight angstroms resolution, you can you can tell them apart and actually tell if you've gotten the solution right. Okay. I actually don't know of, uh, off the top of my head, a protein that only binds one or the other. Most bind. An interface At that interface between okay. them, different okay. interfaces between them. Um, all right, and so uh, what eventually worked to get higher resolution structures of microtubules was basically combining all of this uh, information over the over the history of an analyzing the sample together. So I was involved in this particular work where we could decorate um, microtubules with kinesin. And then actually use 3D classification to basically separate apart um, the different symmetries that coexisted in our sample. Um, and then we borrowed Chuck's trick of basically rotationally averaging the microtubules, um, but then we could cut out the single good protofilament with a wedge-shaped mask and actually rebuild um, a sort of corrected microtubule um, using that one good 
um, for your comment. So uh, the time we were able to get, um, you know, about a five angstrom resolution structure at the microtubule. This was actually right before direct detectors came online. This is actually like kind of a good, um, sort of like a transition fossil in the uh, in, in paleontology. In the, the very same year, um, Ri Zheng from it was uh, the Nagas lab was able to get a 3.5 angstrom resolution structure of, in this case, uh, a microtubule decorated with a, a different protein, uh, EB3. Um, but I think, um, you know, this protein makes a difference. It, it, it does help order the microtubule somewhat, but I think really the, the biggest difference here was actually the detectors. So um, you really can get much, much better uh, reconstructions um, using very, very similar processing methods from a, from a direct detector. Um, okay. Uh, um, and I'll just mention that um, even more recently, uh, Re working at Ava's lab, has managed to get very, very high resolution structures of microtubules with no decorating proteins at all, um, just exploiting um, the high resolution information and the prior knowledge that you should be up or down one uh, tubulin molecule within the helix um, to get uh, better than four angstrom resolution structures of. of these seam featuring microtubules. Uh, so I think this really, if you go, I'm not going to go through this whole flow diagram, but you can see that uh, that was really involved in, in um, really integrating all the uh, approaches that have been used uh, to get, um, to manage to achieve this. All right, <clears throat> so I'll just uh, close here by going through a couple more examples of uh, dealing with um, things binding to your helix. Um, so if you have a helix on top of your helix, um, which was observed uh, a couple times with microtubule specimens, it is sometimes possible to actually separate the two helical species in Fourier space. Um, I'm not going to go into detail about this, um, but I'll just point you to these papers if you want to uh, read about how to do that. Um, it is not super, super hard if the helical parameters of your two helices are very different. So you can see here, this is a kinetic core complex from yeast that actually can be induced to form nice big spirals around the microtubule, but it actually doesn't match the microtubule symmetry at all. So you can actually basically imagine how you would separate those in Fourier space because your layer lines will have different spacings. In this case, where you have two tubes of tubulin wrapped around each other with very similar spacing, that causes a lot of problems. But it is um, theoretically possible using a sort of iterative procedure to separate those two if you have an initial guess. Um, if you have something that's, uh, again, with a very different helical symmetry or a large asymmetric object, like a ring wrapped around your helix, as was the case also for the Damlon complex, then you can basically just use signal subtraction, which is a really common procedure now in, in single particle analysis. Um, uh, but this particular approach does require that the thing binding your helix uh, is really big, so that you, once you've subtracted the signal, you can still align it. Um, so this is not that general, I would say, um, but could work in select cases. Um, what does work, however, if you have something small binding your uh, helix, uh, is this approach that was recently developed by Chuck Sindela, which I have called a maximalist reference-based approach. Um, so what this requires is um, some prior knowledge of how this, how this other small uh, binding partner binds here, in this case, microtubule. Um, so for in the case of kinesin, right, we already had a pretty good idea of how kinesin binds the microtubule. But in the cell, you know, kinesin doesn't completely coat a microtubule, and instead you'd have um, dimeric motors walking along your microtubule. So the goal of this study was to actually visualize one of those dimeric complexes on top of the microtubule. But if you look at the raw images, you can see that the signal from the microtubule completely swamps out any signal you get from the little dim dimeric kinesin. So you have to somehow find it. And so what Chuck did was to basically make synthetic models of what all possible combinations of kinesin molecules bound to microtubules would look like. So you could have one here, and then another one there, or you could have two in a row, or you could have only one, or you could have 10, and basically computationally enumerated all of these possibilities, 
I then did a sort of massive multi-reference alignment on those data. I was actually able to uh, basically extract computationally where he had only two kinesin heads in a row. And so again, this works um, because you have these really nice uh, high information content images these days. Um, and by doing that, uh, he was able to get, uh, in this case, a sub-nanometer resolution reconstruction of a dimeric walking kinesin where he could see an asymmetry between the two heads on the, on the microtubule. They've since um, not yet published, but they are getting even much nicer high resolution reconstruction. But again, this, this, so this should work for a lot of these set of skeletal motor type complexes where you already have a pretty good idea of how it binds but it is, does require a lot of prior information. Um, and I'll just close by saying if you don't have prior information, an approach that should work, and I think people will increasingly use, is to use tomography. So basically, if you can have a reconstituted preparation or even inside of a cell, um, some motor protein walking along a microtubule or other um, helical filament, if you can find that in your tomogram, you can then just use subtomogram averaging to get a structure. And I think this is, um, something I'm really interested in doing and something that we're working on in my lab. Um, so with that, I'll stop yammering and take any questions that you might have um, about that part. Is that the end of your lecture? Or? Yes. Oh, okay, got it. Yeah, any questions for Greg? Um, All right, go forth and process <laughs> healing. <laughs> well, let's thank yeah. Greg. Oh, wait, Yamsi has a question. Yeah. I mean, you've been talking about a lot of the details of dealing with some proteins, but have, have you been used to look at other interesting, maybe even like RNA, DNA mixed helixes? I don't know, maybe they might be just asking about I, I don't know of an example of someone just looking at uh, like an individual DNA helix, just because I think it would be too small yeah. to align. Um, uh, but that, of course, may change in the future, right? Mm -hmm. um, uh, but uh, yeah, so I don't know of an example of that. I have a generic question. Yep. When you're talking about the amyloids and how they have, uh, they have, they ch there's the challenge to align them at low resolution. Yep. Is there something about beta sheets themselves that have low resolution, like low contrast? Uh, versus alpha helices, or no? So um, maybe I didn't make that clear. So usually when we're aligning, uh, the actin is a good example, mm -hmm. or the or the tubulin, right? So when you have a helix of of tubulin, microtubule, right? Uh, the thing that's producing this diffraction signal is a globular protein. So it's not a single secondary structural element. Mm. It's actually an object that is on the tens of nanometers scale, right? Okay. So that provides a low resolution signal like a that is not thing. swamped out by the noise in your, um, in your image, in your raw image, right? Um, so you know, when you align single particle images, you're not usually aligning them based on the four angstrom resolution. You're aligning them based on the 30 angstrom resolution. Actually, it's the same signal that your eye picks out in the image when you're like, there's a particle there, uh -huh. right? Okay. Um, in the case of an amyloid, there is no such feature. The first feature is four angstroms, right? So you can't actually uh -huh. orient that, um, and neither can the computer, uh, unless you manage to use Relay. Cool. Yep. Anything else? All right. Um, no. Yeah, let's thank That's Greg. Great. Yeah. My pleasure. Wednesday? Wednesday will be a journal club. It will be announced to you by email. <laughs> okay. All right.